weeks that go by and people come in and they see you and talk to you and I've been counseling for years a lot of years we have people that come in and they are worried about what they're going through and the Bible says not to have any kind of a fear or anxiety it says cast all your care on him for he careth for you when we know that God has said this to us we need to learn how to trust him that he cares for us he's going to take care of it he says he will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus so when we say these things to you today we're talking we're going to talk about success because that's a worldly term but we're going to talk about success God's way because that's not a worldly term God has terms that he spelled out for us. And in the process of that, he spells them out for all of us the same way. It doesn't matter who it is that checks out his word. It's the same. If you think you're the most lowly in, uh, person on the earth or you think you're the highest person on the earth, quite frankly, if you'll humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, you'll find out that he answers a lot quicker than he does when you think that you're something and you know what you're made out of. The Bible tells us when God created man, he created him out of humus. Humus is dirt. How many of you found some people that you call, you know, you thought they were dirty? <laughs> yeah. How many of you have ever taken a bath and looked down in the tub and saw that it was muddy, you know? <laughs> but the truth is, is that God made us from earth, breathed into us and made us living souls and with that he intended for us to live for him for his purpose God never intended for you to ever be poor ever be sick ever be lost never be taken in sin he never had that was never in his mind that happened when people began to believe that you know that somehow they had a better idea than God now let me say this to you I know sometimes you, you've met people and you thought, that's the dumbest person on earth. They're dumb as dirt. Yes. Then you go in the mirror sometimes and you look in the mirror in the bathroom. You know how it is when you, you've done something foolish and you go and look in the mirror in the bathroom and you look at yourself and, why would you do that? That's stupid. That's just dumb as dirt. You know, truly, without God, you, you're all dumb as dirt. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm dumb as dirt. Okay, I did not say, tell them they're dumb as dirt. No, 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 that is not the deal, see. No, see, you have to claim it. See, without God, you're dumb as dirt. That's what, it, that's what you are. Without God, you're, you're humus. You're dumb as dirt. So don't get upset with me and write me letters, okay, because that's exactly how things run. God made you out of dirt, and without Him, you are dirt, right? Okay. Put a little water with it, and you're mud, right? Okay, all right. So don't get upset with me. Don't write me letters and emails about that. I really, truly, I get thousands of those a week, and I want to tell you something. I don't have time to answer all of those people that are criticizing. If I find that you're criticizing something and I'm preaching out of the Word of God, I want you to know what happens to your email. Maybe this will cut out three or 400 of them every week so you know if, if you send me something and it's critical of what I have put in the uh, in, in the sermon and it comes from his word I will I have a button one button and it says delete and it's deleted so don't don't even bother you're gonna waste your own time because if I know what's in the word of God and I preach what's in the word of God and you send me something trying to criticize it listen I had somebody that was an Episcopalian this week and they were telling me about the Episcopalians had had begun to uh, want to change the sex of God. In other words, they want to make God a sex. And so they wanted to take all of the words that had to do with God, the, the uh, masculine words, and they want to take those out of the Bible. And they want to put a neutral word in place of, a, can you change the Bible? Can you change this word? Say. You know, when you think you're smarter than God, then you go go ahead and do that. And when you have to face him, realize he's going to tell you you're dumber than dirt. Okay? That's just foolishness. You know, he tells me in his word through the Apostle Paul that people that think that they're wise, 
You see, he says their wisdom is foolishness to him. And until you come to that place that you realize that you're a fool without God, you, you have foolishness in your mind. And God wants your mind to be in his mind. He wants you to have the wisdom of God. You know, I think people, when they begin to ask God for wisdom, I think that's the beginning of their spiritual life. Because then God gives them wisdom above the wisdom of dirt. He begins to show them things they do not know, and he begins to lead them in, in paths that they have never even been down or even considered. God says some things, some, sometimes I go to him, and that's the first thing I always ask him for. Lord, I need your wisdom. I need your thoughts. I, don't, I need your mind about all of these things. And then when he shows me something, it comes into my intuition. It's something I know that I wasn't sitting there thinking about. It, can, it just comes in. <laughs> And, uh, and then you're going, yeah, you know, dumb as dirt does that. You know, it says, yeah, you know, we're sort of like Forrest Gump. You know, we look at things and go, huh, my mama said. Well, anyway, my daddy said, and my daddy is God, and, uh, I, you know, he is a father to the fatherless, and so he became a father to me a long time ago, back in 1971, and... Uh, and when he did, I realized he was there with me all along the way, no matter what I was going through. And I drug him through some difficult times. I want to tell you, y'all ever drug God through difficult times? You know, you brought him into things that you ought not to have brought him into and stuff like that. But God, in his love, is merciful, and he's long-suffering, and he waits for you to begin to repent of things and repent a change of heart and mind. And when you repent... God is near you because it requires humility for you. When you repent of your sin, you're, you're humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, right? Now, I want to tell you something. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. There's nobody like God, you know, because you can talk to him about anything, and he does not bring condemnation to you. It's a great thing. You know, I talk to some humans, you know, and, and they all want to judge and condemn. And I'm going, why are you doing that? Don't you know this is not going to work well for you when you do that? If you judge somebody, you'll be judged by the judgment you judge with. If you judge that kind of thing, to, and, you know, and, you know, I, I understand. I'm humus, and without God, that's simply all I am. But with him, I'm a son of God. Now am I a son of God, not in the future. I am now a son of God. That means that I'm one of the, uh, the many brethren that Jesus talked about. With that, I don't sit back and say, one day I'm going to be like Jesus. No, I am as he is. The Bible tells me that. As he is, so am I in the earth. Jesus told us, he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So the very thing that God has done, think about it, with Jesus. Jesus has done with you. He's called you according to his purpose. His purpose is not to judge the world. He didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God does not want people to be condemned. He doesn't, you know, that's his, that's his own words on that through Jesus. He said, I don't want anybody to be condemned. In the beginning, when the angels showed up, what did he say? He said, peace on earth, good will toward men. And at the end of Jesus' life, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the truth. People do stupid stuff. And you know what? God wants to save them anyway because he understands they don't understand. But when he saves you, he changes who you are. He changes your personality. He gives you an identity. My God, many people that I talk to don't even know who they are. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be. No, no. See, we came here with him for his good purposes. And so with that, he called us according to his pleasure. And so when we're called according to his pleasure, then God uses us according to his will. Do you know, just like the scripture, it was sent in the, and the scripture was given, and it said all of those things that, that he has said were sent in the earth. They were going to, like the rain, they were going to come down, and they were going to produce the fruit that he intended them to. Do you know that he did the same thing with humans? And you might not think that you're anybody, but I want to tell you something, that God has a different idea about that. God wants everybody in this room to know who they are in him. With that, then there are things that he can do with you. 
when you began to acknowledge him, the Bible says that in Proverbs, it says acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. Say, don't lean on your understanding, but acknowledge him. Just acknowledge him. God, I know that you put me here, and I know that I'm humorous. I'm nothing in front of you. And that, see, that's humility, and so grace can then be given to you for your time of need. But until you actually do those things, you know, you're running around saying, God, you know, aren't you glad that I'm somebody down here and I represent you? And now, darling, I want to tell you, there's a bunch of people going to hell that had that, that very idea. You see, lest they humble themselves in the sight of the Lord, he can't lift them up. But when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. That's what the Scripture teaches. But today I'm going to talk to you about God's way of success, and, and it starts this way, favor. Forgiveness, favor, and, and provision. First, forgiveness, right? We're going to go to Isaiah, and I know y'all don't bring Bibles to church anymore. You read, uh, you read off your your iPad, your iPhone, your you know, and all those kind of things, right? Uh, I'm I'm just okay. You can go to the website, you can go out there and download the uh, you know the very thing you're looking at on the screen here, Isaiah chapter one. Isaiah chapter 1, when you get there, say amen. amen. Okay. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, and it says this. Come now and let us reason together. This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah the prophet. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though you've done all the bad things you've done, and th and though your uh, your those sa very same sins... He says, he says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like cr crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, would you say that out loud? If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. <coughs> but if you refuse and rebel, would you say that? You shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God doesn't change, ladies and gentlemen. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So is Jesus. By the way, <coughs> the same Jesus, y'all excuse me for all this barking this morning. <coughs> you know, been one of those weeks, you know. But anyway... But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. How many of you notice that there is a lot of murder going on in the land? People killing one another. Life doesn't have any value, any meaning. People go out and they do things that they ought not to do in places they ought not to be doing it. And the process uh, that somebody will turn around that has the spirit of Satan in their hearts. Satan is a murderer from the beginning. He is a murderer. And uh, he will cause people to have that in their heart, to murder, to hate. Now, I want to say something to you. Even the worst person that's ever hated me and said ugly things to me and that, I don't hate them. And that was my dad, who beat me and left me for dead. And I don't hate him. I loved him. And people said, why didn't you, you know, how, how is it you love somebody that beat you and hated you like that, said things against you? And I, I'm going... You don't understand, you see, because down in my heart, I had his heart, and his heart is love, and his heart is love, and he says, you know, don't hate anybody. If you want to be like me, don't hate anybody. Now, you see, people choose who they will serve, but God doesn't want anybody to perish. <coughs> Amen? Nobody in this room has ever done anything that God is not willing to forgive. And he doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't perish, meaning he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. So, but in this scripture, though, it kind of takes in a lot of the things that we as Christians sometimes forget. Come now. Let's look at these things. Because, see, if you notice these things, go ahead, Terry. If you notice, there were conditions in these scriptures. There are people that want what God has to offer, but they don't want to give what God requires to get it. Is there anybody in this room that knows what I'm talking about? 
And I see it all the time. People want, God bless me. And if God doesn't bless me, then I'm going to curse God, right? No, no, darling. I want to tell you something. You see, there are terms. God has laid terms for you. Conditions. And that's what we're looking at in those verses above. You know, the ones that we looked at. And, and Isaiah, go back and look at it again. Isaiah 118, next scripture, there you go. Look at what I've highlighted here in red. Come now. What does now mean? Right now. Before you do anything, what are you supposed to do? Get in touch with him. I'm talking about anything. Now listen, I want to talk to you. See, I heard somebody this morning early were talking about Moses. Moses wanted to know God's ways. And God showed Moses his ways. But he showed Israel his acts. Those people didn't want to know him personally. They wanted Moses to go and find him and then give them. Listen to me now. They wanted Moses to get the word of the Lord and then come back and tell them. But when we read this in the Bible, Moses had come back and they said, Put a veil over your face. You've changed. When you get in the presence of God and want to know God, He changes who you are. He changes your countenance. He changes your thoughts. He changes your heart. And people will want to come and hear what you got to say, but I want to tell you something. When you get to the place that you want to know God, it's not about Him. He changes who you are. Does that make sense to anybody? You see, God wants you to know Him. That's the reason He sent Jesus so he could reconcile you to himself, so he could take your sins out of the way. No matter what you've done wrong, he wants to take all of those sins out of your, out of your way. And with that, when he takes all of those sins out of the way, he reconciles you. He brings you back into a place where you can have a relationship with him. God did not want some sort of platonic religious relationship with you. And I don't, I'm, I'm not against church I, I don't want anybody in the world to think that because I have people that think that I'm against church. I'm not against church. See, I am the church. You are the church. The ecclesia, those called according to God's purpose. It's not a building or an organization or a program. We are the church. When we come together, we're the assembly of the church. That's what God called us to, to be assembled together so that we could build each other up in Him, right? But see, when he called a church, he made the church. It is his church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And there's a lot of people saying, well, you know why you keep doing what you're doing? Look, because, uh, let's see, I didn't call me, nor did any human, and I'm still doing, you know, four to seven years after he called me, what he actually called me to do. Four to seven years. Some of you aren't not 47 years old yet, right? <laughs> some of you liars. <laughs> Saw some of these older folks. No, I'm not. I'm not four or seven. Yeah. No, okay. I can look at your hair and know what you are. <laughs> For heaven's sake, when you got hair as gray as the hair on my head, you know, on your chin, I know what you are. You know, I know. I know. He says, "Come now. Don't wait. When when you're going through something, don't wait to go to God." It's important that you go to Him now. When, when do you need God? Now. When you're going through something, when do you need Him? Now. So He's saying, come now. And then He does what James does, you know, about this issue of God doesn't, uh, uh, you know, He doesn't upbraid. He doesn't hold things against you. Come now and let us reason together. And then He, he puts it there in black and white for you. Says the Lord, Though your sins are like scarlet, in other words, you are filled up with sin. Though they, uh, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, I'm not going to hold what you've done against you. Just come to me. Come to me. Then he says in verse 19, listen to this now. There is a word here. I want you to look at it. It's a two-letter word, if. What is an if? It's a condition, isn't it? If you're willing. He's waiting on you. It's not, 
you waiting on him. Honey, you've got to go to him. Run to God when you're in trouble. You need to run to God. And you need to do it when? Now, when you're going through something, it's a now deal. It's not some time in the future. God wants you to come to him with all of your cares. Cast every care upon him for he careth for you. So then he says here, Though your sins are like scarlet and they shall be white as snow, they, though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, he's not holding, he's going to make you right in his sight. White like it never occurred. If you are willing and obedient, did you see two words there? Willing, that means you want to come to him, you want something to change. And then when he speaks to you, obedient. In other words, willing to do what he says. You shall eat the good of the land. In other words, what he's going to do is prosper you in such a way that you will know that it came from him. Now let me say this to you. You might have all kinds of skills, but you have nothing that God didn't give to you. How many of you in this room ever went to, went to high school? How many of you went to college? Okay. How many of you went to graduate school? Some of us did. You know, and let me say this to you. In spite of all of those things that humans taught you, God will teach you things you don't know. Men can only go so high, but God is much higher. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You see, they're higher than ours. So with that, he says, if you're willing, when you come to me, and obedient, when I tell you what you need to do. Now, I want to tell you something. Let's talk about your ears. I've talked about this before. You know, everybody in this room, as far as I know, except some of you females, I can't see your ears, but some of you males, I can see your ears. Some of them look like Mickey Mouse. I'm telling you the truth. They stick up there so big. Anyway, but anyway, the, I see you got ears on the side of your head. You know, what is an ear for? It is built so that you can hear. But spiritual ears, not everybody has. The Bible tells us that we need to have spiritual ears. You can't have spiritual anything until you have a Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. He gives you ears to hear what God is saying. And what does that mean? Here's what it means. Some of us in this room don't have ears to hear. Now why? Because, well, this isn't where I'm at. Darling, you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. Have you figured this out? You do not know what tomorrow holds. But you know who holds tomorrow, right? So listen to me now. So if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Isn't that a condition? If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So if you're not willing and obedient, what does that mean? You do not eat the good of the land. And I have people all the time, well, God's not a respecter person. No, he is not. But he does have conditions on your being able to receive what he is offering. You have to first hear what he has to say. And second, you have to submit. The whole of the kingdom of God opens up when you learn that submission is necessary for you to receive what God has. And until a person will, will submit to God, they cannot have what God, that's the if in this statement, okay? But if you refuse, there's another if, but if you refuse and rebel, in other words, God tells you what you need to do, and you say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I had people that come in, and they have problems because they serve money. Anybody in this room ever serve money? You see, money is a tool like anything else, like a hammer and a toolbox. Money is there to take care of the needs both of the kingdom and of you. And if you are willing and obedient, listen to me now, because I've had people come in, they, they would leave because I'd talk about money. Now, I don't, you know me, I don't talk about money every week. You see, because I don't get that's another God. And people that worship it, and they want it, and desire it, and all of those kind of things, he says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. 
Anybody that's ever wanted to be rich, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But it tells us here in this scripture, if we refuse to hear him, now he said, I'm first, there's no other God beside me, right? And so you can't have another God. Money cannot be your God. You cannot serve two masters. And when he was talking about that in context, it was about God and money, mammon, another God, what they worshiped, what they gave value to. Now let me tell you something. Money isn't anything to God, and he can cause people to give unto your bosom, press down, shaking together, and running over. He'll take care of all of your needs according to his riches, and his riches expand beyond anything you see. He owns everything on the earth. By the way, you make anybody have to give it to you. He'll put it in their heart. Give that person this money and give them that money and that kind of thing. And we've had it over the years. I go to the mailbox and I'm going, how are we going to make it, Lord? If you don't come through for us here, I mean, we're in trouble and that kind of thing. And then I say, but Lord, you promised me in your word, and I believe your word is true, that you would take care of all of our needs. According to Rich and I, I'd open the mailbox and have a $5,000 check sitting in the mailbox. Had one of those this week, didn't we, baby? <laughs> I was so glad for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so very thankful that God is faithful who has promised. So God knows how to take care of us, right? And, you know, I, I'm not selfish because I want to be like God. See, he tells me that I ought to give. I ought to be like him. I ought to give. And so I turned around and I wrote somebody checks. I mean, wrote two people checks this, this week. And I was going, <laughs> you ain't nothing. God gave it to me. Cost me nothing. I, I give it to you. It's, it's nothing. And I just want to be obedient when the Lord says so. But I, I started preaching one day, and I watched people get upset because I was I was touching that touchstone, you know, that place where they were they they were kind of sensitive, you know, they were worshiping. That was another god, and I got on their got on the top of their toe, I guess, a little bit, and I said, "You know, look here. See, just because I say that to you doesn't mean that you ought to be angry with me. I'm telling you that God told you that you can put no other god before Him." And when you do what he said, if you're willing and obedient, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. That sounds like Malachi to me. You know, if you do this, you don't steal from me, and you take and you give back the first fruits and all of that. He said, when you do that, I'm going to rebuke your devourer. In other words, what's been stealing your money, I'm going to rebuke it. I'm going to put that that devour away from you you will not see it anymore even the lands of far off will begin to look at you and say you're blessed and I've, I've in my life I've actually seen that we give to people far off now, I'm not telling all of you people out there that have your hand out all the time and never give anything uh, to, to write me because I've got people asking me to build buildings in countries around the world and things like that and I'm going you need to understand what you're called to. You're not called to a building, an organization, or any program. You're called to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You don't need a building to do that. Okay? When you're called to be an equipper of saints, then those people you mentor into the kingdom so that they can go and do likewise. That's what we do. We equip saints for the work of the ministry. Not everybody is a five-fold equipper, but everybody is a preacher, and everybody is sent. Amen? Okay. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. And I watch that all the time. Where does the adversary get through? See, because light is always greater than darkness, and God is able to, uh, to raise up a, a standard around us so that the adversary can't get through do you know that every time we've watched and, and I mean I don't want to discuss these things on television but you know there have been people in government that want us to even exist but God was able to raise up a standard against them and I thank God that he has not only that in this nation we're watching that standard being raised again it's being raised up against those people that wanted to call good evil and evil good and I'm very thankful to God for that. Amen. Anyway, there are four words in that particular scripture. Come, 
now. Let us reason together. And uh, if, and then but. And when we look at that scripture, we have to realize that God desires something first off. Uh, you can go ahead, Terry. In Isaiah 18, a, it says that come now. God wants no separation between you and him. There are people that want to put God on their terms, but God wants to put them on his terms. I want a relationship. I am loving, caring, forgiving, merciful. I don't upbraid. I don't hold your past against you. I'm not like you. And when you come to me, you see, you're not going to find any of those things. Even Jesus said, that's not me. I'm easy to be entreated. You know, come learn of me. Come find out what I'm about. Be like Moses. Desire something deeper than I want to see what you do. Come desire to know me personally, intimately, and I'll show you things you don't know about me. But he says here in 118a, come now. Spend time with me. God desires for you to purposely spend time with Him. Do you spend time with Him? You see, because without doing that, you don't know who He is. There's nobody in the world that gets engaged or in a relationship of some sort that if they find themselves in that relationship that they don't want to spend time with one another. You know, back in 1974, July of 1974, July the 12th, 1974, I'm looking at my wife. She's wondering if I remember the day. I, look, I remember it. Boy, I look like somebody that was on a three-day drunk. I'm telling you the truth. You look in the mirror. Uh, you look at those pictures and stuff. I, my eyes were just glazed over. I was going, what am I doing? And, and, and I think she was doing the same thing. We all got, got cold feet on that day, and then he, he started saying things, and we started saying things, and the next thing we know, we're in a car going towards Sinclair. Going to spend a one-night honeymoon in Sinclair. Anyway, we, we, we look at that situation in times past, and, and, uh, and I think, you know, that was 43 years ago. It'll be 44 this year. Got somebody that's here. Our minister of music is here, Carla and Alvin. They've been married today 23 years, right? Okay. Hmm. One day you'll be married 43 years, right? 44 years. You know, I know I've, I've performed the ceremony for some of you, and you've been, how long y'all been married now? Yeah. 18, going on 19 years, you know, and things like that. Look, God is able to make all things work, and he's able to make all things abound toward you. But there is a requirement. First of all, you have to be His. And you have to want to des and desire to know Him in a personal way. God will not withhold Him. He said, if you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. If you come to God, He will come to you. That's what He said. You know, all you that are thirsty for righteousness, He said, I'm going to fill you up. I'm going to fill you up. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, I'll I'll make you the most righteous person you've ever seen. I'm going to fill you up. God will make you righteous. But you can't make you righteous. You've tried to. You know how it works when you try to be better and all that kind of stuff. Now, I, don't, I, I want to say something to you. I don't want you to be upset about this. I think there is a self-righteousness, and I think we all, ought to, we all ought to have it. You need to present yourself righteous before humans. Because of what He is, we ought to be like Him. And he called us into perfection, and we ought to be perfect. But you can't be perfect without Him, right? You're perfect. You're made perfect. You're made righteous in Him and through what He did for us. And because of that, somebody says, I'm just a human. I'm not perfect. I'm going, you stupid and don't know it. You're just still humus and don't know that Jesus has already done something for you, and you haven't received it. 
But if you received it, you can be the, the righteousness of Christ and, or, or the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Is that right? I wish I could change the words of the whole religious world and say, look, don't call things as they are, but call things that are not as though they were. You see, the, call yourself into sonship. Go on and open your mouth and declare what he declared about you. If you keep declaring the same old stuff over and over, I ain't nothing, I ain't. Look, false humility, that is not humility. Humility is to call yourself what he is, knowing that you aren't. And when you know that he's called you according to his purpose, he knows what you are, he made you from what you were made out of. And with that, he called you according to his purpose. His purpose, a dynamic, greater than your thoughts, greater than your words. God called you to be sons and daughters of God. The Bible says that the world can't receive that because they can't see him. They won't receive you either. And that's the reason you got people around you. Religious people, by the way, and let me say this to all of you religious people out there. I'm not getting on your case, but Jesus had an opportunity in the Scripture on every page of the New Testament to be against you. And he said, unless you become greater than those religious people, you know why he's enter into the kingdom of heaven. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, thought they were better than everybody else. Let me say something to you. The only reason you're better than anybody is you receive Jesus. Other than that, you're still humans. Amen? Nobody wanted to say amen to that. Yeah, that was a low amen, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this principle of God wanting to spend time with you, you know, you don't want to spend time with somebody you don't like, Right? You spend time with people you like, somebody you love, you care about, people that love you back, and that kind of thing, right? If you don't, then, you know, you're still humorous. You, got your, you fell on your head at birth, right? <laughs> Wasn't my fault. <laughs> Mama shot me out like a bullet, you know? <laughs> Come on now. Matthew six thirty three. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. Do you hear something very similar to Isaiah? When you give in to what I'm saying, you can have what I say. Go ahead to the next one. Matthew 6, 6. And it says, But when you pray, go into your room. Now, I do this. I don't know if y'all have a room to do this in. <laughs> I've got two. I, I go to the bathroom. If I go to the bathroom, nobody else around. I can talk to God, and they don't even know what I'm... And let me say this. If you're spirit-filled, and you don't know how to pray, and that kind of thing, go on and pray. Well, I don't know. I don't know about all that. And it just comes out of my mouth. If you weren't thinking about it, and it came out of your mouth. It was Him giving you the utterance. If you're sitting there thinking about what you're going to say and all that, it's not him, it's you. Okay. Brother Ron, are you a Pentecostal? No. I'm a Christian. I'm a biblicalist, meaning that what he said, I, I will do. And if he said that I can do it, I can. Y'all did read John 14, right? And the things that I do you shall do also and greater things than these because I go to my Father, which is in heaven. You see, I don't base anything that I do or believe off of something that is not in the Word of God. I base it off of what he said, the thus saith the Lord. If he said it, it doesn't change. There's a lot of people trying to change the Word of God. For heaven's sake, they can't even sing the songs that are in the hymnals anymore because they... They're afraid that they're going to offend somebody. They're not politically correct. Listen, let me say something to you. If you're trying to be politically correct, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Because you're not wanting to please God, but you're wanting to please man. And you see, the Bible tells us you can't be a man pleaser and please God. And if you don't please Him, you won't spend an eternity with Him. 
So get rid of your political ideology and, and go on and, and accept Jesus Christ and His ways and His Word as the only Word of God. And there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. Amen. So anyway, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. God doesn't care if you're in the bathroom. I go in and sometimes I lay down in my closet and I lay on my face before the Lord. I'm putting my face down in the floor and the dust bunnies and all that stuff. And, and I'll, I'll ask God to hear my, please hear my prayer. And I'll thank Him for who He is and all He's done for me. And I'll go in the bathroom and I sit down on the seat. And that's a very humiliating place to be, you understand. And God will come meet you in the most humiliating places. You know what I mean. I don't have to go there. Most of you know what I'm talking about. But he says, shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. In other words, God will listen to you when you're alone. When you're not trying to... Uh, you know, be approved of others when you're praying and your prayers are just between you and Him. I see people all the time that want to pray, but they want to pray openly in front of people. And it's a show. It's a dog and pony show. God won't hear you when you pray. You humble yourself in the, in the sight of the Lord. And your Father, who sees in secret, will, hear, listen to these words now, will reward you. When you do what he says, when you're obeying what he says, he will reward. Everywhere you find obedience in the scripture, you find God coming through to, uh, to reward somebody for their obedience. Does that make sense to you? Okay, let's go to the next one. It's in Psalms 103, 4 and 5, and it says this, Who redeems your life from destruction? Well, would you answer that question? Who? God. Who crowns you with loving kindness? Who is it that crowns you with loving kindness when you don't deserve it? Okay. And tender mercies. It's God. Who satisfies your mouth with good things? Isn't that what we just need? Cause you to eat of the good of the land? Oh, come on. Now, over the years, I want to tell you something. I've had to deal with you, church. I'm trying to bring you up. In all of these years, I've tried to bring you up higher. I don't want you thinking like humans. I want you thinking like God. I want you to know that God would withhold no, listen, God would withhold no good thing from them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. No good thing. Do you understand that? Well, you know, it's, you know, it's got to be a good steward. You know, you're just stupid. If God gives me Listen to me now. If God gives to me the ability to obtain wealth, if God gives me promotion that comes from the Lord, and God gives it to me, don't be stupid. Don't listen to me now. I don't want you to be stupid. God gives to you that you might enjoy it. If you're sitting there pinching every little nickel you get, you're not enjoying anything. See, because you're worshiping the nickel. You're not worshiping God who gave it. And God doesn't have a limit on nickels, dimes or dollars. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than you ask or think. And when you talk different than that, you're not in Him or with Him. You are not, see that if belongs to you. Through the years, I've tried to bless people that don't even want to be blessed because, you know, brother, you know, they're not a waste of money. I'm going, God, help them see. You know, down in my heart, I'm going, they're stupid as dirt. Who gives us the power to obtain wealth? How many of you are sweating to get it? If I sweat, it's because I want to sweat. I get out and I cut my grass and nobody gives me money for it. And I guarantee you I sweat a lot when I'm doing it. I get out in a rape yard and I guarantee you there's going to be drops of, you know, <laughs> something going to be falling off my forehead. 
and nobody actually gives me anything for that. I don't do everything I do for money. You understand that? Because I don't worship money. Do you know many times I'll do what I do? I'll cut the grass or I'll rake the yard. I'll make everything pretty because I know you're going to come. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to be proud of what we have. And that kind of, I want you to be blessed because we do those things. Most of you know I rarely ask you to do anything. Because if I pour it out, I'm going to get it back somewhere. If I'm doing it for him, it's coming back. If I cast it on the water, it's coming back on every wave. Isn't that what it says in the Bible? This isn't just about money. You understand my labors and everything else. My love comes back to me if I give it. People will love me like I love them. There's a reciprocation for everything that we do. And you don't understand who it is that gives the increase, you see. When you forget who it is that gives your increase, look, you want to be loved, love somebody like they've never been loved. Care for them. Take care of things that they didn't. Look, somebody dies and somebody's sitting around grieving all that. Look at here. Tell, uh, go on over to the house somewhere and, and, and bring some food to them. Or, or worse than that, go on and ask them. If, you tell them, you're going to the grocery store. And, uh, you know, while you're going, is there anything they need? And pick it up and don't go give them a bill for it. <laughs> Do something. You, you know, ministry is meeting the needs of one another. The church has got to get back to that heart of Christ of giving and loving and caring for each other. And if you don't love, you can't be His. Amen. Psalm 103, 4 and 5 says, Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with love and kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle? I ask him every day, Lord, give me more hair on my head and take some of my wrinkles away. <laughs> Let me eat something that I don't even know will make me have the fountain of youth. You know, go on and help me even in my old age to be able to act like somebody young. I can't get that up very far, but, you know, I used to. <laughs> but I know that God is the one that gives me the power to continue to do what I do. Amen. Before I talk about favor, and I'm running short of time here, but I want to go quickly. I don't want you to miss anything, though, before I talk about favor. What is favor? Favor is not an accident. It happens. It's a cause and effect issue. You do this, that happens. Isn't that what God said? If you be willing and obedient, I'll cause you to eat the good of the land. I've eaten in some five-star restaurants, and I want to tell you something. The bill was high, but the food was excellent. There have been times I put something in my mouth, and I was going, Oh, Lord, I don't want to even eat this quick. It was so good. I mean, I've been in places where they were, I'm telling you the truth. And, you know, shame on you, bonefish, for getting rid of that pork tenderloin that y'all used to have. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> shame on you. Anyway, <laughs> it's a deliberate design by God to reward you for acts of obedience, invisible to others. God will reward you, and everybody around you is going, why are you so happy? Why you got that smile on your face and all that? You know how snarky people can be. They don't want you to be happy when they're not happy. Look, I want to be happy just so that they can learn that there's something better than what they're going through. I want them to see that God is able to make me excel even when everybody else is not. God, he's not going, he doesn't have to show it out. That's what I'm telling you here. It's invisible to others. Sometimes they don't know why you're happy. Why are you smiling? Oh, why are you smiling? What are you smiling about? I, ain't nothing. I, look, I got up and I'm breathing today, and that's better than being in the dirt six foot under, right? Come on now. I can't even, you know, it's just beyond my, 
thought process for people to think, well, I'd be better off dead. I'm going, look, you mean you want to be worm food? Is that what you like? <laughs> Come on. Now, I'm not going to be worm food. I'm going to be, what is that other word? Burnt, cremated. That's just a nice word. They're going to burn you back into dust. Still going to the dirt. Something will still crawl through your remains. Somebody said they're going to be putting all ocean. I'm going, <laughs> look, the fish are going to be pooping you all over the place. That's just the way it is. Anyway, I better get back on the subject. Favor is when God causes someone to desire to become a problem solver in your life. Have you ever had God send somebody along just when you needed them? Or say something when you didn't you didn't have an answer, and then all of a sudden God gave them an answer for you. That's favor. That's God's favor. He causes things to shine on you when you're going. This is the darkest period of my life, and and God just keeps shining things. And and you know how it is. You know when you're bad, and then you come to God and all that kind of thing, and you you're you're expecting some sort of whipping, and and your expectation is God's going to throw you away. And the next thing you know, he does something good to you while you're in the middle of the darkest hours of your life. And, and he's good to you because that's how he is. He's good. And that goodness that God has toward you is meant to lead you to repentance, a change of heart and mind. But favor is, is the willingness and desire and participation of someone to help you advance and obtain something that you want. How many of you have ever had anybody do something for you when you couldn't do it for yourself? favor and, and they might want to boast about it but God had to put it in their heart before they would do it amen Isaiah 1 19 says this it said uh, well wise hearts look for opportunities to show favor Isaiah 1 19 says if you're willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land favor isn't a mere miracle but a reward for faithfulness you want the favor of God. Everybody wants the favor of God. Start doing what he asks you to do, and the favor will follow you. What did he say that in Psalms, you know? He says, behind me is what? And it's following me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you understand? God is good. He, he's not good on your terms. He's, he is good beyond your definition of good. Okay? The first way that favor is unleashed in your life is your desire for God's wisdom. If you ask God to give you wisdom, He says that He will not upbraid, He will give it to you, and He will continue to give it to you. Okay? In Proverbs 8, 32 and 35, it says this, Now, now, therefore, when you see a therefore, you need to know what it's there for, right? So, now, therefore, listen to me, my children. For blessed are those who keep my ways. Do we keep having one thing repeat over and over? If you keep being obedient, you're going to be blessed. For blessed are those who keep my ways, not my acts. I'm not sticking my hand out and saying, God, give me, and, and I don't do something. No, it doesn't work that, that way at all. You see, when I ask him to let me know him and know about him, he's, he's going to show me his ways, not his acts. The acts follow me seeking him. And so, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Don't hate it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gate, waiting at the post of my doors. In other words, we have to have an expectancy that God's going to show up in the middle of all my waiting. For whoever finds me finds life. Listen to this. Whoever finds me finds life. You're not alive until you find him. And uh, you obtain favor from the Lord. So if you find him, you find favor. I'm trying to tell people how to have success God's way. 
He doesn't change it. It's written so that all of us can know it. <laughs> Explaining this, okay? God says, listen, my children, blessed if, if you keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Don't disobey me in this. That's what God's saying. Blessed is the man who listens to me. Watch and wait at the door. People, listen to me. You don't know how important it is for you to come to church. More than anything else you do. Hearing His Word brings faith to you that causes the pleasure of God. You can't please God without faith. And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And how will you hear except there be a preacher? Just like the, the Israelites. They wanted to see what he was going to do, but Moses wanted to hear what he said. Want well, to know his ways. Don't disobey me in this. Blessed is the man who listens to me. Watch, waiting at the door. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from God. Obtains favor from God. Secondly, diligence creates favor. In Proverbs 13, 4, it says this. The soul of the lazy man desires and has nothing. If you don't come to the Lord, you just... I'll never pick up the Bible, you know, I'm just, you know, I pray every once in a while. No, look, you're lazy, and if you don't pick up that Bible and seek him and say, speak to me, he won't. You say, you get what you seek for, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Did you hear what he said? A lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent, those that seek after the Lord, will be made rich. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth is gained by, uh, by dishonesty will be diminished. In other words, if you get it, you're not going to be able to keep it. But he who gathers by labor will increase. In other words, don't be lazy in what you do. Third, uh, understanding heart, uh, uh, the understanding heart attracts favor. So if you have understanding from the Lord, when I ask Him for wisdom, I'm asking Him not on, only for the wisdom, but for the understanding that goes along with what He says to me. There are many people that would want to try to split a participle with me, and I want to tell them this. Look, I know what you're talking about. I've been where you are. And I'm not, not trying to put myself above you, but I want to tell you something. Until you have the revelation of who He is and, and, and how He is, then you're not going to get the things that he has to give to you. Don't sit here and try to put the letter on somebody because the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life, okay? Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding gains favor. Okay, so if you understand what God ha has to say to you, you will gain favor. But, isn't it something that we always have that but show up in there? There's a but in every crowd, isn't it? But the way of the unfaithful is hard. Are y'all ready to go home? Anyway, fourth, appropriate and right words often generate favor from those, you know, listen, around you. When you have wisdom of God, you know how to talk and present yourself before others. Have you ever seen people that just, they don't care what comes out of their mouth? Oh, no, no, no. See, that isn't the way, see, there's life and death in the power of the tongue, and unless you got the bridle of the Holy Spirit on you, you got this, that, that humus tongue, doesn't care. It's just full of mud, dirt, dirt mouth, you know. The issue of saying what comes up in your head is not what you're supposed to do. You see, he told you that what he puts in your head is what you're supposed to say. And like I said, you know, if you're sitting around and you say, the doctor says you got this or that, you know, you need to tell that doctor, see, he's humus. He doesn't know that God has said something other than what he said. And look, look at me, look at me. I don't care where you're at educationally, and you out there, you're not wiser than God. Only God is wise, and the only time you have wisdom, I don't care how much knowledge you have, I have it too. But that knowledge without wisdom doesn't know how to use what we've learned. That's what the Lord said to me after I got my first doctor was, you know what you need? I'm educated, God. I know what it says in the Bible. You know, you know. I'm coming to you, God. I know, I know, I know some things. No, no. You see, what you need is you need wisdom. You got knowledge, and knowledge puffs up. 
Now you need wisdom, and that will humble you because you realize that what you got is still some human thing that wants to exalt itself, and the only thing that can be exalted is God. There's no power but of Him. So when you start exalting Him, see, you, you're going to get some favor. Some understanding is going to give you some favor. And with that, not only that, he says here, it's going to generate favor from those around you. It'll cause people to be nice. Can you imagine people being nice to you? If they're not nice to you, stop and ask. Have you been asking God for wisdom of words? Ask God for wisdom above the wisdom of your adversary. Cause him to have power over your tongue so that you can say things that aren't stupid. People really don't. I mean, they ain't going, they're not going to be attracted to your stupidity. Stupid is as stupid does, said Forrest Gump and his mom. Okay? Proverbs 16, 13, Righteous lips are the delight of kings. Even the president would listen to you if he thought that you had righteous lips. And, those love, uh, they, and they love him that speaketh right. In other words, that's what the scripture is saying to us that when you speak right, people will love you. When you don't, you know how it goes. Use your own experiences in life. You know, when you, how many of you ever said, why do you say that? That was just so stupid. You beat yourself up like the man at Gadara. Your demons start showing up because you say, oh, why did I do that? It was so stupid. Well, yeah, everybody knows it. You're just finding it out. Okay. Fifth, humility generates favor. And when, you, when you're humble before others, not exalting yourself, if, you, if you'll shut your mouth and say, tell me what's going on with you and that kind of thing, listen to them a while. I know some of them haven't had anybody say that to them ever, so they're going to carry on for an hour. Listen to them for an hour. It won't hurt you. Okay? Proverbs 15, 33 says, fear, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. Before you're ever going to be honored, you're going to have to humble yourself. I don't know why people don't, you know, exalt me somehow. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you why they don't, because you're exalting yourself. Humble yourself and... You might give them an opportunity to say something nice about you, right? There would have been an amen there if somebody had actually been listening to that. Anyway, sixth, an uncommon skill and or anointing often creates favor. Daniel says, uh, you know, you remember this in Daniel. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret, there was a secret in the heart of the king. And nobody, not even his seers and his magicians could ever tell him, but God gave somebody the, the secret of his heart. People ask that all the time. How do you know what I'm thinking? You don't know what I'm thinking? No, I know what God's thinking, and he just said, and they're sitting there going, No, 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 see, he knows your heart, and you can't lie to him, and you can't lie before him. Then the king promoted Daniel. Get this now. Favor came because God was in his heart. He told him what God had said, and when he did that, the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him the ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Can you imagine God saying, tell that man this and you did what God said and all of a sudden somebody says I'm gonna, that man's got God on his side I'm going to put him in a place of authority see if you're ashamed of God he'll be ashamed of you 1 Peter Fair, uh, repentance brings favor you've been doing something wrong over and over and over again you know just stupid and upon stupid First Peter 5, 6 says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He will exalt you when you humble yourself under his hand. Luke 15, 17, 20, The prodigal humbled himself 
to his father. Do you all remember that? He thought he was going to have his father chew him out and give him a piece of his mind and all that. And he got home. Father put a ring on his finger, a cloak around him, called the neighbors, had a fatted calf killed, and, you know, and asked for a celebration because this his son had humbled himself. Last. And y'all are real happy now, right? He said last. Favor increases when you associate with people of integrity. Why do we need one another? I might see you in, in your state, but I want to tell you something. I'm going to be praying for you in his state. Asking God to make you greater than you are. God wants you greater than you are. Shouldn't I be like him? Okay? And if I'm asking you to consider his ways, I'm only asking you what he said. And if you'll humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. And his favor brings with it not only honor, but wealth. Not only that, he changes your reputation before men. I know I've told you all the story and why I took some of the some of the religious people around me and I took them to a place to eat and one of the people I went to high school with and he walks in the door and he says, Hey, Ron, you old bastard. And I smiled at him and I turned around to look at the people that were with me that were had that old religious spirit on them, you know. And I looked at him, called him by name. I won't call his name on television, but anyway, I called him by name and I said, God bless your heart. How are you doing? And that kind of thing. Patted him, hugged him up close, you know, because people that are still in the world don't know what to think about all that stuff. You're either gay or something strange. Anyway, anyway, I, I hugged him up close, and I said, I'm just so glad to see you. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm retired now. And then I said, well, that's good for you. And you, you doing anything in your retirement? Well, yeah, sometimes. And all that. He said, what are you doing? You see, because... You, you, re you reap what you sow. I sowed asking about him, so I, I reaped it. And he, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a man of God. He said, well, okay. okay. Good to see you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how you can tell them you, you become different than what they knew back when you were the old bastard? <laughs> I'm thrilled when people know that I'm not what I used to be. See, new creature, absolutely. The last one, anyway, increases you uh, when you associate with people of integrity. Boaz, you remember Boaz? Yeah, he was a great rich man, and, and there was a woman who had lost her husband, and then she had a daughter-in-law, and she had lost her husband, and they went and they started gleaning in this man Boaz's field. They, then they found out they were related through, uh, through Ruth and and uh, and all of a sudden he finds out he's related to her and he finds out she's a widow and she's very humble and she's out there gleaning in the field and that kind of stuff and he tells his servants that are out uh, you know harvesting the field he said leave something behind for her in other words you go on and pluck it but leave it so she doesn't have to pluck it just put it there in the basket and God started blessing her and the next thing we know, he started blessing the daughter-in-law too. Because Ruth was blessed of Boaz, so was the daughter-in-law. In the worst of situations, God left. He took care of every need that they had. And then Boaz takes them into his own home. Can you imagine that? I'm so thankful that God has some Boazes in this world. Anyway, let's go on and... Let's finish this thing. Closing, God desires for you to purposely spend time with him. Second, God wishes to restore, forgive, and cleanse you from anything that you've done wrong. He doesn't want those things between you. See, it's never between him and you. It's between you and him. So when you're doing those kind of things, you feel like, oh, nobody loved love me because of what I've done. No, so you come to him. He forgives you for what you've done. And he won't hold it against you. God encourages willingness and obedience. If you're willing to do what he says and your obedience, then he's going to reward you, which is number four. God rewards and prospers people that obey him. You want to be what God wants you to be because there's no way for you to be blessed and, and, and prosperous 
unless you're doing it his way. He didn't say do these things your way. He says your way was a way of flesh and death and that kind of thing. But his way was a way of life and eternal life and blessings, prosperity. And prosperity reaches every corner of who you are and what you do. It even reaches the people that you have things to do with. If you're hanging around with people that, that, uh, you know, that are not people of integrity, you know what the scripture, I just read it to you. You see, if you hang with people of integrity, you're going to have integrity because people will associate you with the people that are obedient and blessed. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this word. I ask you, Heavenly Father, to open the eyes and the ears of people that hear it. I pray that you'll allow hundreds of thousands of people, even after I'm gone, to see and receive the things that are being said here. They are your words, and Lord God, we know that they never change. I pray, Lord God, for all those that will listen, even those that will listen today, that they'll know, God, you're on their side, that you bring no condemnation with you when they come to you. And that, Heavenly Father, you're always wanting to prepare them for more than they are able to receive. Help them to see this today. For your name's sake and your glory. Amen.